Welcome to another edition of From the Preacher Study. Uh, my name is Kevin Clark, and I, along with my colleague and friend, the preacher here at the Oak Mountain Church of Christ, Bob Hutto, have the pleasure of bringing to you some things from God's Word. Uh, as you know, we have been in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, dealing with and trying to extricate things from the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we've had a delightful time doing that. It has been very enlightening for me. Uh, we often say that uh, as much as the benefit uh, attenuates or goes to the teachers or to the students. Sometimes the teachers get as much, if not more, and certainly I've gotten a lot out of this study. It's been really great for me. I've used it for some sermons and things of that nature, and of course, applying it to my life, looking at myself. And so we're very, very thankful that we've been given this opportunity. Uh, I hesitate to say this, but I've been told by our technicians that we've been at this for about a year. So <laughs> I don't know if that's a record of sorts, but uh, you know, when you do things in 20-minute, or I should say 15-minute segments, uh, it takes a while to make your way through. But I think this teaching has been very valuable. I hope that you feel that way and that uh, you have uh, gained a lot from it. We want to thank uh, our two deacons who are our technicians, uh, Mark Townsend, Jason Reed. Appreciate them and all the help that they give us. And uh, they've been very supportive. And, you know, it takes time to be a part of this. Not only time here, but time uh, to make sure it gets up and running on the web and is accessible via the various uh, softwares and programs for podcasts. So we really appreciate the sacrifices they've made for us to be able to do this. And we appreciate you, uh, the listeners. I know several of you guys have been listening from day one. Maybe we picked up some people along the way and we appreciate that uh, some of y'all have shared that with some of your friends and neighbors and co-workers and fellow students and thank you for doing that continue to do that uh got any introductory comments well i would just say if you if you do enjoy it if you enjoy the bible study that we do tell other people about it sometimes yeah. we might feel a little self-conscious or a little timid about talking to other people about religion it's one of those taboo subjects you know but just right. here's a way to maybe break the ice just say hey i know of a podcast you might be interested in and uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, thinking about the Word of God. And, and, and that might be a good introduction into, um, into Bible study and Amen. introducing people to the teaching of Christ. And so bring other people in if you can, and uh, maybe they'll benefit from it as well. Amen. Well, we, as we said, we've been studying the, the Sermon on the Mount, and this will be our last time addressing that formally as such. And what we thought we'd do in this particular session is to, to look at, maybe from a holistic standpoint, kind of summarize, although I will tell you, it is a daunting task to try to summarize the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount in about 15 minutes. So I don't know how effective a job I'll do in that, but I certainly will lean pretty heavily on my brother here uh, to do so. But I want to share a few things at the beginning in terms of how I look at uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And really, when we ask yourself, you know, what, what is this, these chapters all about? Well, we're asking ourselves, what does it mean to be a citizen in the kingdom of Christ? What is, who populates the kingdom? Who makes up the kingdom? Who comprises the kingdom? And those are the questions that are going to be answered by Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, we do live in a kingdom. Our king is Jesus. And we're being told who are the people who make up this kingdom? And that's being defined in a couple of ways. One, what are they like in terms of their disposition, their spirit, and their attitudes? And then what? how do those attitudes and how do those dispositions manifest themselves in our lives? In other words, who are we and what do we do? If we're a citizen of the kingdom, who are we and what do we do? And we see that all throughout the book. You know, We start out with the Beatitudes, a heavy focus on the kind of person that we are. What are the attitudes we have? We're, we're poor in spirit. We're hungry and thirsting for righteousness. We're merciful. We're pure in heart. These are the attributes of those are in the kingdom. And we made this point. Sometimes people will misread this list and say, well, I'm just going to pick and choose like a smorgasbord and say, okay, I'm going to be the poor in spirit and, and you be the meek and uh, the deacon over here will be uh, the peacemaker. No, we have to be all of these things. All of these things are required for us to be a citizen of the kingdom. And so you don't get to pick and choose. We all need to be poor in spirit. We all need to mourn. Uh, we need to be meek. We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And so this is almost a checklist, an inventory for us to look at ourselves and see who we are. And then the rest of, of the, uh, the chapters really go into how do those attitudes work in our lives? What does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does it mean to be a peacemaker? And so when you ask yourself, again, who's in the kingdom? It's the people who are described in verses 3 through 11 or 12 in Matthew chapter 5, but it's also the people defined by what they do in the rest of the chapters. And so, you know, ask yourself the question, 
who uh, populates the kingdom? Well, there are people who are seeking peace among their brethren, so much so that if they're at the worship and they're about to give their gift at the altar, he says, you know what? If you got a problem with your brother, go back and reconcile it. Those are people in the kingdom. There are people who uh, understand that violence starts in the heart. And so I'm not worried just about the physical taking of somebody's life, but I'm talking about hatred that ultimately manifests itself in murder. I want to nip that in the bud. Who is in the kingdom? The person who controls their lust and controls their desires for the opposite sex. You know, Jesus talks about it's not enough simply not to commit adultery, but if you look at a woman to lust to her, he says you've committed adultery in your heart. Who is the person in the kingdom? He's a person who values marriage and understands it's not about the paperwork of putting somebody away that uh, so many of the Pharisees are fixated with, but it's the idea of staying with this person, staying with this woman, staying with this man, or until death do us part with the exception of sexual immorality. Who is the person in the kingdom. He's the person that doesn't need to add all these uh, qualifications to his statement or her statements. When they say something, let your yes be yes and your nay be nay. Uh, Who's the person in the kingdom? They're the person who knows rather than to respond in kind to somebody, they actually rise above that. And even when somebody strikes them, they turn the other cheek. Who's the person in the kingdom? They're the person that doesn't just love the people who love them, which is kind of a base level of morality that most people operate on, tax collectors and things of that nature. He says, no, no, no. In the kingdom, you love those who hate you. You love your enemies. Time and time again, what we're seeing is Jesus as a king says, you're going to be different in my kingdom. I know that you've heard these things in the past and the Pharisees have told you this and the scribes and all. This is different. And, and even in that, he, he does make a point that he has the authority to be a king uh, because he refers, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, that there really isn't this tension that some people wanted to at that day and time present between the old law and the new law. He says, look, I didn't come to basically abolish the old law and say it's all wrong. I'm going to throw it out. I'm going to institute something new. He says, really, there's a seamless transition because the old law always was always was looking forward to my coming and was looking forward to the new law that I was ushering in. So he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And so we should not think that what Jesus is doing is something uh, revolutionary and he's coming and making his own stamp separate and apart from what God has done before. No, he is a king but he is a fulfillment of the old law. This has always been contemplated. So it really shouldn't be. Yes, it's a new law with a new priest and new king, but it really shouldn't be stunning. It really shouldn't be so different because the old law prophesied about this. The old law told of this new king's coming. And so I love the way he establishes with his Jewish audience that, look, yes, I'm a king and I'm going to speak with authority and things are going to be different in my kingdom, but it really shouldn't take you by surprise because this was the plan all along. Well, it just occurs to me that this is all, can all be done. I mean, it's volunteer. Yeah. It's voluntary. We take it on ourselves. It's within our power to cultivate these attitudes and uh, frames of mind and approaches to life and then putting them into practice, you know, put, taking those beatitudes and putting them into practice, doing them. Uh, for m- most of us, you know, we're, we're born in, in, into our citizenship. Right. Uh, it, uh, it is on the basis of our parentage and where we're born and things like that. But this is this is something that we choose mm-hmm. to be a part of, and so it's it's up to us to cultivate mm-hmm. these these attitudes and these these ways of thinking about ourselves, and it's up to us to be consistent in the practice of those things. And Absolutely. so, if you want. If you want to be a citizen of right. this kingdom, you can be a citizen. But these are the responsibilities of citizenship. Right. But you can do it Absolutely. if you will. Yeah, and that's what he's teaching us. And I like that point. You know, we've made this point multiple times in the podcast. How much emphasis there is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 on what the citizens in the kingdom do. What do they do? Well, uh, they, they don't murder. They don't hate their brother. Uh, they don't lust after women. They don't look at women to commit adultery in their heart. Uh, they don't, uh, uh, their yes is yes, their nay is nay. Uh, they go the extra mile. Uh, they love their enemies. Uh, they're very careful to be genuine in what they do. They're genuine in their charitable deeds. They're genuine in their prayer. They're genuine in their fasting. Um, they don't lay up treasures in this life, but they're laying up treasures in heaven. 
they they don't use hypocritical judgment. Uh, they're judging with righteous judgment, and they're you know, looking at themselves and taking care of things before they take care of other people. But the point is, look at how much teaching there is on what citizens of the kingdom do. They do this, they don't do these things. And so that tells us that it's a doing citizenship. It's a doing kingdom. And in fact, uh, we talked last time, it, it, very fitting to sum it up, to say that ultimately citizens in my kingdom do what I say. That That's it. I mean, and all these different things that you've talked about, what do you do with fasting? What do you do about riches? What do you do about the lamp of the body? What do you do about prayer? What do you do about the narrow way? Versus what? He says all of those are just aspects of, of my teachings. But the ultimate summation is if you want to be a citizen in my kingdom, if you want to be the beneficiary of my kingdom, you've got to do what the king dictates. You've got to do what I say. And all we have in Matthew 5, 6, or 7 are just different aspects of his sayings. And if we get these things down, we said this before, if we get these things down and we understand what it means to be a citizen in a kingdom and who the king is, then Jesus can tell us all kinds of things, things that will be talked about later in the aspired epistles and talk about the church and how local congregations are to be organized and how people are saved and how people, what are the qualifications of elders and deacons. When you understand that you're a citizen in the kingdom and you have these attitudes and you do these kinds of things that are laid out in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it's easy for Jesus to tell you some more things. Remember in John 16, he said, look, I can't give you all truth right now. Uh, you're not ready. You're not able to handle it. But the Spirit will bring unto you all of these things, all truth. Mm -hmm. And we have that in the epistles. And so sometimes people say, well, it wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the foundation. They're the fundamentals. But they're not everything. And the Lord said that. He said there's more to come. So if we get the citizenship of Jesus' kingdom down in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, then we can go on to some of these other things. But uh, one of the things I wanted to contrast too is that notice that being a citizen of the kingdom means to be sincere in the things that you do. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do charitable deeds not because we want to be seen by other people, but because we care about those whom we're helping. Uh, we pray not because we want to be impressed impressive to other people, but because we genuinely communicate with our Father in heaven. Uh, we fast, not because we want people to be impressed on how religious we are, but because we're making some kind of uh, conviction to deny the body of certain things for the purpose of glorifying God. And you see time and time again in these uh, Beatitudes and in the Sermon on the Mount that being genuine, being sincere, doing things for the right reason is so very critically important. Well, I think you're right. You know, there is an emphasis on putting these things into practice. But again, it comes from uh, the properly cultivated inner person, mm -hmm. the poor in spirit, the, right. the meek. And so he says in chapter 5 that our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. Exactly. And so maybe the Pharisees were more concerned with the external. Yeah, yeah. They might have been doing the right, right things, right. but the inner man of, the, of theirs was, was not right. And so their motive was wrong. And so it's not an either this or that. It's a combination of the two. We cultivate that inner man. We cultivate that right inner spirit. And that produces the kind of obedience or the kind of, of, of doing that the Lord uh, desires from us. One of the things I want to do before we leave, and, and this maybe is not a summary, but something that jumped out at you from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and I'm going to ask you in a minute, I want to tell the audience what jumped out at me, and, and that was Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And one of the things that jumped out to me at the study is that the Lord is telling us just how difficult it is uh, to get to heaven. Not impossible. It can be done, and, and we certainly don't want to uh, ignore that point. But I do think it's good for us to know it's going to be a struggle. And I thought about in my own life, you know, anything that's worth having, it's worth struggling for, okay? And, and there are a lot of things in life that we will go without and we will discipline. You know, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 27, all of the rigors that an athlete goes through in order to win this perishable crown. And, and in life, the things that we have uh, studied for, prepared for, we spent time, effort, money, sacrifices. And do we expect heaven to be any different? Do we expect heaven's just going to be easy? Everything else in life we have to work for. It's hard. It's difficult. But heaven is going to be easy. It's a walk in the park. No, the Lord says this is going to be difficult, but you can do it. And that to me is something I take away from the Sermon on the Mount. It's just the struggle we have. Satan knocks us down. We, we knock ourselves down. We just got to keep getting up, keep fighting, 
it's never over. The battle, as long as we're in the flesh, the battle between the spirit and the flesh will be there. But uh, we we can do it. We can do right. it. So that's yeah. what. What do you take away? What's some of the takeaways? Well, there's so many things, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so many things that I need, and so many places where I can improve. I think about you know Jesus teaching on prayer, yeah, and how applicable that is, sure. you know, and how. Uh, I, I can certainly use that and improve Amen. improve my prayer practices. His 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 statement: Don't don't worry. Yeah. You know, yeah don't worry about what it. you're going to wear, what yeah. you're going to to eat, and things like that. Your father knows that you need those things. Just just seek his kingdom first, That's and right. and he'll provide those things. I think about that passage at the end. You know, Matthew chapter seven, mm-hmm. when he says, you know, many are going to say to me in that oh, day, yeah, you know, a day yeah. of judgment. Yeah. Uh, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Seems like they're caught off guard and they're yeah, they're caught yeah, by surprise. Yeah. We thought we were ready. Yeah. We thought we were doing great things uh, in Jesus' name. And Jesus says, no, I, I never knew you. Right. I, I've never knew you. Right. And so we can maybe deceive ourselves into we thinking, I'm, I'm doing great things for the Lord when, when really... We're, we're not doing the things he would have us do. Absolutely. And so we just need to check ourselves and check ourselves against the teaching of Jesus and make sure that we we are doing his will, yeah. not our own in his name, but yeah. actually doing his will. That's a great point. And it just, uh, you know, Paul says, uh, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And boy, these chapters are a great basis for self-examination, to look at yourselves and see yourself, not as your mother sees you, but as God truly sees you. And I think we all would admit, once we look at the standard, we come up short. Uh, but that's the thing, is that God is with us. God is revealing to us our shortcomings, deficiencies, but there's something we can do about it. As James 1 talks about the man who goes into the mirror, you don't want to be the man who immediately forgets the kind of man he is. Mm-hmm. But no, 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 we see the kind of person we are, what we need to do, and we continue in the faithfulness of what has been revealed to us. So we can do those things. Uh, we've run out of time. There's so many wonderful lessons that we can gain from this. And uh, I'm not going to suggest that Bob and I, during the course of the year that we've studied, <laughs> have plumbed the depths of the Sermon yeah. on the Mount. There's still a lot to be unearthed from that. But I hope that you've enjoyed it. It certainly has been beneficial to me, uh, beneficial to my spiritual walk with God. And I would encourage you to continue to study this, get the foundational principles right. In my walk with God, as I get older and older, I just realize how important it is to get the right attitude, the right attitude towards my God and the right attitude towards my, my fellow man. And, and that really is difficult because there's so many things that are vying for the control of our hearts and minds. Mm-hmm. And so it means we have to be careful about the entertainment that we involve in ourselves in, the books we read, the music we listen to, just everything, you know, whose mm-hmm. feet you're sitting at, what you're learning in school. Uh, just be careful because before you know it, stuff can get in there that corrupts you from the correct way of looking. And that's why it's so important for us to stay in the Word for it's important for us to assemble with fellow saints because for me it brings me back to what truly is important what truly is uh the path of life that we're trying to pursue so it's been a great study really appreciate it brother i appreciate your insights you've certainly benefited me and i uh, hope that we'll continue to do this and other uh scriptures sure. and other subjects well we've all benefited and I, I hope it's been beneficial to the people that have been watching and listening as well amen amen well we always end our podcast with a prayer and so this time will be no different when i ask brother hutto to lead us in that yeah, word of prayer will our father in heaven we're so thankful that you love us uh, and that uh, you desire to have fellowship with us even though we're sinful beings even though we've committed sin uh, still father you love us and you want to have fellowship with us Uh, You loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world to atone for our sin through the shedding of his blood. And Father, we are so thankful for that. We're sorry that uh, our actions have made that necessary, but we're so glad that you're willing to send your Son and and, uh, through him we might have the forgiveness that we need. We're thankful, Father, that your Son came into the world, that he taught us these things that we need to know. Uh, Otherwise, Father, we'd be groping in the dark, uh, that we would be uh, making very weak efforts somehow to to be in fellowship with you and to please you. But through Christ, uh, we know what we need to do. We've been taught what we need to do to be right with you. Help us, Father, to receive the teaching of Jesus and those uh, who come after him and teach in his name and teach by his authority. Help us to be receptive to that teaching and help it help us father to make the proper application in our lives help us father to see ourselves the way you see us in those areas where we need to improve 
Help us to make those improvements. And those things in our lives that we need to eliminate, help us to eliminate them. And Father, we pray that you will help us see you the way we should, to see your glory, to see your holiness, and see those wonderful attributes of yours that make make you worthy of our devotion and uh, our uh, our faithfulness. Our Father, we pray that as a result of this study, that we'll be more the kind of citizens in your kingdom that you would have us to be. Help us, Father, to reflect upon the teaching that uh, we've been studying this year. Help us to reflect upon that and help us, Father, to assimilate it into our lives so that we will be uh, a proper citizen of the kingdom of God. Father, we pray that you'll be patient with us, that you'll have mercy upon us as we grow and as we develop, and that we become more and more that kind of person that you would have us to be. Help us, Father, to take what we've learned, the light of the gospel that we see, and that we might uh, that we might share it with others so that they can see the light of the gospel themselves and be drawn into fellowship with you and glorify you. We pray that those doors of opportunity will be open to us, that we'll see those opportunities and that we'll take advantage of them. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we continue our lives, uh, that you'll help us along the way, uh, that we'll continue to grow and develop the way we should. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.